afternoon session, and we will start with Karen Halbeck. She will talk about novel subbands in electronic spectral densities of correlated systems. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on time. <laughs> we, had a, uh, we started late today. Uh, well, I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, this is my first uh, in-person uh, workshop after the, the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's so exciting to, to meet everyone and, and to see people I haven't seen for so long, old friends. And also to have, I mean, it's not only in person, but also the discussions are sort of, sort of more 3D. The more, the, the go, you can discuss much more in depth and physics. And it's, uh, it's really, I mean, uh, after the pandemic, uh, it's, it's good to realize how important it is to meet. Uh, I'm also very happy. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Teresa, Carol, uh, Marcello, Walbert, for organizing uh, this meeting. Uh, I think it's, uh, it has a regional character, which I think is very interesting, and, uh, and this is what we are, uh, what I am enjoying a lot, and also the, the discussions, and I hope to finish on time so we really have 10 minutes of discussion. Uh, so well, let's get into, into what, uh, what I wanted to tell you today. I'm a theorist. Uh, I work in Bariloche, in the south of Argentina, in Patagonia, and, uh, and there we have, a, a high, I mean, some, some of the things I'll be talking to, to students who, who they might not know where the Balseiro Institute is, an atomic center. It depends on the National Argentine Atomic Energy Commission. And we have a group on theory, on theory of condensed matter. Uh, this is a picture uh, from uh, close to where we live. And what I want to tell you today um, if concerning physics is, um, the following, I mean, we have uh, developed uh, for several years already, since 2005, with a joint work with Marcelo Rosenberg, with Eduardo Miranda and other collaborators. Uh, we developed what uh, we think is a very um, uh, precise method, numerical method of calculating spectral properties of correlated systems. And this is what I want to show you today very briefly talk about the method, because I don't want to be too technical, but I want to tell you about uh, the consequence of using a precise method in uh, looking at spectral densities, and we did find novel structures, novel subbands, and we're able to look at, into more detail at the zero temperature for now behavior of, of electrons in correlated systems. Um, so, 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 um, I don't know if this works. Um, well, I think, I, no, it doesn't seem to be, I'll do this. It's too connected to the other computers. Um, do you have a, this is a pointer. No, wait. The, um, here, yeah, okay. This, that, this is enough, this is enough. Thank you, Elena. Uh, well, so, so here I want to mention some of my, of my collaborators in some of these papers uh, with Gabi Kotliar, with Marcelo, who I'm also uh, uh, just mentioned, Masatoshi Imada in Tokyo, Daniel Garcia, former student of mine, Eduardo, Uriel Nunez Fernandez, a former student uh, who is uh, now in, in France, uh, Armando Aligia, Ruben Huet in Buenos Aires, and, and my Students, uh, Naira Aukar, she is now at, in Trieste for a couple of months, and Hernán Fernández García is my second Cuban student. Uh, so um, what, we, what we did is, uh, just in a nutshell, before I go into details, is we are solving the DMFT, and uh, thank you, Eduardo, for having introduced the DMFT this morning, so I won't go into those details, but remember what Eduardo said, that for the DMFT, the bottleneck is the, the resolution of a complex impurity problem. This is the, the most complex part because this part uh, integrates and has all the, the interactions. So we have to solve this complex impurity problem using some method. And we will be using the DMRG, which is the density matrix normalization group to solve this. Um, and, I, and then I, I tell you more about, about this. So having, uh, Having this uh, impurity solver allows us to really find these details I want to show you. Uh, so then I will, uh, I will show you uh, some concrete examples in, in a two-dimensional square lattice uh, for, for the multi-orbital, the two-orbital, or um, 
the Kanamori Hubbard Hamiltonian, which is a, a paradigmatic model for these systems. And then uh, towards the end of the talk, I want to show uh, some, some examples, not using DMFT, but using DMRG alone, too many acronyms, so using the, the, the density matrix realization group on a one-dimensional two-orbital model where we do see the features again. And this is also interesting because in the extended model, we're not resorting to the, to the local approximation that is used in the DMFT. So this shows that the results we find in the DMFT are not due to the local approximation, but can also be found in an extended model, although it's a one-dimensional model, but it's already something. So uh, the motivation of, of looking uh, at, at multi-orbital Hamiltonians is very, very briefly, and I'm leaving many things outside, but during these days, you have seen many examples of of, of different interesting systems, always correlated systems, in where we can find interest in physics. And I'm interested in looking at, the multi, uh, at, at models where it is important to consider more than one band. So models where we have uh, itinerant uh, electrons interacting with more localized electrons. And uh, here are some examples, like for example, ion-based superconductors, transition metal oxide, like the ruthenates, manganites, etc. cetera, um, e even helium-3 bilayers, and rare earth heavy fermion compounds, so we have 4F and 5F F electrons, like the cerium-based compounds, etc. even uranium compounds. I mean, this is just a motivation. All these systems, you have to include more than one orbital. These can give rise to in-gap states. This is what we want to look for. And they also have what is interesting in part of this talk, the orbital selective mode transition. An orbital selective mode transition, you know about the mode transition, we've heard about this in, uh, during the week. The orbital selective mode transition is when you have several orbitals and uh, where you can find a mode transition in only one of the orbitals and not in the other. For example, you have a mode transition in one orbital and the other remains metallic. And this is because one orbital has uh, larger hopping, and so it, is like a, it has a wider, uh, a, a smaller mass, it has a larger, sorry, a, lar a, a smaller mass, it has a larger bandwidth compared to the arm which can have a lower bandwidth. So one ha can have different hoppings in the different orbitals, and this the orbital differentiation can come from, for example, as I say, different bandwidths, uh, different crystal field splittings, or different orbital degeneracy and, and different complications. So well, this is only the, the introduction. Just to throw you the Hamiltonian, this is what we have to calculate. And this is really already <laughs> very, very complicated. The Hamiltonian, I mean, I'm drawing one dimensional. This is the first orbital. Uh, this is the second orbital, and this is a third orbital. They don't have to be separated, but they could be separated with crystal field. Um, and, uh, and this is a one dimensional drawing, but really I, I'm, I'm looking at a more higher dimension. So this could be the first plane. I mean, this could be all in, on a plane where you have three orbitals per site, okay? And, uh, and the orbitals, they have, one can have a perpendicular hopping mixing the orbitals, if the symmetries allow. We have chemical potential. We have hoppings in each orbital or even mixing the orbitals where a, alpha and, beta and beta are orbitals. And we also have a local interaction and the local interaction, this V, is complex. It has a, a well-known Hubbard U which is the on-site on and, and the intra-orbital, you see alpha and alpha, uh, um, double occupancy interaction. Then we have inter-orbital parameters, which I would call U2. U2 then is the repulsion between electrons in the same site, but on different orbitals. So we do not have only a local U, but we also have a Coulomb repulsion between electrons on the same site, but in different orbitals. And this does not depend on the spin because I can have, I can have one electron up and one down, or one down and one up, or, or two up. So they all pay the same uh, inter-orbital um, repulsion, um, Coulomb repulsion U2. And there's also a Hund coupling, which is written in this form, where here we have two different terms. Uh, uh, these, these A's are uh, electron fermionic operators, like, I mean, these are the electrons. One term of the J has to do with the uh, spin flip in different orbitals, and the other term has to do with a pair hopping. I mean, uh, you, you can read a very nice uh, paper by Antoine Georges and collaborators in justifying these, this model. 
So um, we won't look at the three orbitals, although we could, but I want to show you examples with two orbitals with a similar model like this. So we have to solve this. This is a strongly correlated system. This is, has a very high complexity because, uh, it, because we cannot solve for one electron. I mean, many, most of you must, must know uh, the problem, many body problem. We cannot solve for one electron and get the levels and then uh, just uh, fill in the levels. We have to put a certain number of electrons or a certain chemical potential and solve for all those electrons. And this is a huge Hilbert space and we have to diagonalize this huge Hilbert space. And this is why we're going to use a DMRG to reduce the number of states using concepts of quantum information because we're using what is called the density matrix. And the density matrix um, gives us an automatic way of choosing the states that are more, most important. So we're going to throw away, we're going to neglect states that have very low weight in the density matrix. These states are negligible. We, the, the, the DMRG gives us an intelligent way of choosing states that have a high weight in the states I'm interested in. Ground state and excitations. I'm going to use the DMFT, so the dynamic and mean free theory. So, this, uh, uh, so now you have to remember the talk by Eduardo. And uh, so then we have uh, an extended, a bulk system with, with interacting sites. And uh, then we pinpoint one side and we call this the effective impurity. There's no impurity in the system, but this is the effective impurity of the model we have to solve. So we put the impurity, well, here we have all the U, the J, all the interactions, and we, we uh, hybridize the impurity with a non-interacting medium in a, in a self-consistent way. This is the DMFT. Inside this DMFT, we're going to use a DMRG as impurity solver, as an extra uh, uh, method. So I won't go through all this, but uh, you see uh, this, this is the iteration procedure of the DMFT, and at some point we have to calculate the Green's functions of this complex impurity where they, they include the inter uh, interactions. This, uh, so here we're going to use the, the DMRG as impurity solver. Very briefly, uh, a, a very brief review on the impurity solvers. Here I'm mentioning some of them. So historically, the, uh, there have been all these impurity solvers. People have really looked through this. Uh, iterative preservation theory many years ago, exact diagonalization. What, what do we have to use this for? We have an interacting impurity with a non-interacting bath, but the impurity is hybridized. We have hybridization, so like Hopkins with a bath, and we have non-interacting bath sites with certain um, diagonal energies. This system, we can put a finite number of bath sites and we have to solve for this finite system. So the, the exact diagonalization takes very few bath sites and solves for this. This is why it's a little bit limited because we only have very few uh, states in the uh, bath sites. Hirsch phi, quantum Monte Carlo, non-crossing approximation, a numerical normalization group. This is very good because the NRG was developed uh, by Wilson, and, and it's really it's a method, numerical method, which is tailored for an, an impurity uh, coupled to non-interacting electrons. Uh, so then, more recently, we are using the DMRG, which I mentioned. Uh, then, more recently, also the uh, continuum time, continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, flex time evolution bond decimation, which, has, which, which is related to the DMRG, configuration interaction techniques. Uh, then you can, you can look this up. Uh, the DMRG has several advantages, and now I'll tell you which they are. Uh, so this is, how, this is how we code it. Uh, we, the square is the, is the impurity with interactions, and these are non-interacting bath sites. Uh, as you see, this is, like, this is a star geometry, because if you open this up, we have, uh, I mean, I, I drew it like this because of the DMRG, but here we have the impurity, and then we have a star geometry. These are hybridizations to a non-interacting bath sites, okay? And this, is, and this has the U, the J, what, the U2, whatever. So what we did is we flattened this, and we, I draw it this way, this, because uh, Uli Scholberg and collaborators showed that for, for using the DMRG as impurity solver, this uh, geometry has the lowest uh, von Neumann or entanglement entropy, which is important for the DMRG. I mean, it has to do with the entropy, with the quantum entropy. Remember, we're talking at T0, zero temperature. So for a single impurity, we have this configuration. For two impurities, 
Two impurities can mean many things. We can have, for example, two, um, we, could, we could look at the Hubbard model, the single band Hubbard model, where each, this is one site because it's one band, and this is the neighboring site, and uh, the neighboring site, and they're connected via the hopping. So this would be the cellular DMFT. One can also look at four sites. Uh, so one, one could consider all this as a complex impurity to pour into the DMFT. Uh, but this could also uh, mean two different orbitals because we could have a single site but with two different orbitals or three different orbitals and I would have three squares and that would be the single site DMFT but with three orbitals or with two orbitals. So, but, but the mathematical or computational coding is exactly the equivalent. And each one of these orbitals is uh, hybridized with a non-interacting uh, site and this is how we write the Hamiltonian so we have the, the whole Hamiltonian of the, we have to solve for this, we have to solve for this huge monster here. And uh, so the whole Hamiltonian is the local Hamiltonian plus the, the, uh, the Bath Hamiltonian, and the Bath Hamiltonian has the hybridization plus the local, so, so local interactions and the hybridization. And, uh, and, we, and then we use the DMRG to sweep back and forth along these structures, and we use the DMRG for the dynamics. Which are the advantages of the DMRG? The advantages are several. Uh, the most important advantage is that it uh, converges in the DMFT iterations to the real omega axis, to the real frequency axis. Uh, this is, if you compare to uh, the complementary method, which is quantum Monte Carlo, like CTQMC, the CTQ, CTQMC converges on the imaginary axis of Matsubara frequencies. The convergence for CTQMC is much faster, but then once you have the, the Green's functions on the imaginary axis, you have to use analytic continuation, which was mentioned many times, to take it to the real axis. And with this process, which is quite ill-posed, it has a lot of error, uh, it's error-prone, uh, you might miss a lot of the details we find by converging directly onto the real axis. Um, uh, if you compare with NRG or exact diagonalization, those also converge to the real axis. But what quantum Monte Carlo has as an advantage is that it can calculate final temperature, which we do not have. So it's, it's a, sort of a complementary uh, technique. And we cannot, we cannot yet put temperature. Uh, now we can, we can look at all frequency scales. That means that we, do, we are not uh, only looking at low frequency like the NRG, now I'm comparing the DMRG to the NRG, because NRG, uh, NRG the Wilson one, is uh, tailored to go to very low uh, energies because it, it uh, entails a logarithmic discretization of the band. So that means that very low energies, close to the Fermi energies, are very well described, but it's not easy to get a good description for high energies with NRG. But with, with DMRG, we can go to any omega scales. Uh, we, can we can look at arbitrary interactions. Uh, we do not have any, any fermionic sign problem, which the quantum Monte Carlo systems do have. If you have system, electronic systems with hybridization, you can bump into uh, fermionic sign problems with the quantum Monte Carlo. We do not have that. We can look at large baths, contrary to what can be seen in uh, exact diagonalization. We can put many bath sites, and we can look at several orbitals. Uh, and several, several sites like the cluster I showed you, and this can give us a better description of the K dependence uh, because, because they are the, um, uh, the, the self energy is not so local because we're considering like a cluster. And then we, so we're moving away from the single site on site limit. Uh, well, so as an example, a concrete example, I'll show you now. Uh, uh, results on the two orbital kanamori Hubbard model. So, it's, so that we're, I'm looking at a square lattice. On, on each lattice site, we have two orbitals. Uh, and so th this is a square lattice. I mean, <laughs> only is this a cartoon? And on each site, we have two orbitals. The, the, um, a, no, a top orbital and a lower orbital. They are degenerate. We do not have crystal field splitting, but we could add it. And then uh, we have these two orbitals. The top one is going to be a wide orbital, so the hop in T, T1 is going to be much larger than T2. So here we're going to have a large hop in and here a low hop in. And we want to see the orbital selective mod where the lower orbital uh, 
suffers a mod transition, but not the, the, the top one. We want to look at that case where this is a wide orbital, this is a narrow orbital. Remember we have empty sites, uh, we have electrons, and when we, doubly, when we doubly occupy a site, we pay energy U. We do not have a perpendicular hopping, so they're not hybridized, these orbitals. And we, have, uh, we could have or not a Hund coupling J, so we, we add it or not. We're going to look at the half field and the dope case, and I'll show you results for both, for both cases. Uh, so this is one of the results and where we found interesting behavior. This, remember, is a square lattice. Um, the DMFT gives us a critical value for the half field system uh, for one, one, so it's one particle per orbital per site, so half field means two particles per site. We, for very large U, we get an, an insulator, and for very small U, we have a metal in both orbitals, and there could be an intermediate value of U in which the lower orbital, the narrow orbital, is much insulating and not the other, like I told you. So these are the three cases. For very large U, this, the orbit zero uh, frequency, these are densities of states, local densities of states, so integrated in K. Uh, this is the Fermi energy, orbit zero. So here, for very large U, we have the lower Hubble band and the upper Hubble band. So these are projected onto the wide and the narrow bands, or red. So red is projected onto, onto the wide band, and black is the, the lower narrow band. Okay, okay? So this is a the projected density of states onto the bands. Both of them are insulating because we do not have density of states at the Fermi energy. And this would, be the, this would be the gap. Now, if we go to the other extreme, to very small values of U, remember we have a wide band and a narrow band, we see this complex behavior here. And uh, so this uh, th uh, is also projected into the wide and the narrow band. You see we have the lower Hubble band here, the upper Hubble band for large omega, and close to the Fermi energy we have a complex structure. We have uh, both bands the narrow, this small peak, and the wide band are metallic because we have a finite density of states at the Fermi energy. This dip here uh, is it's, uh, only a consequence of the finite size of the system, so it, 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 is a, it is a metal. So we have a metal in the narrow, so, but you look at the, the, if you integrate this, the metallic peak of the narrow band is much slower, so it, lower, so it is a worse, um, uh, it's worse metallic than the other one. And, uh, and then in between, in between the, the Hubble bands and the coherent peak, we find, we find these structures here. We find uh, a peak, a, bl a big black peak and a small red peak, and the same here. This is what we define as a quasi-particles quasi in the wide and the narrow band. So this new feature here uh, was seen because of the, of the high precision we have in, in this method. Uh, well, we were surprised to see that at an intermediate value of U, uh, when the red wide band is metallic, but the black band is insulating, you see, we still find this feature here, the black uh, peaks, but we do not find the, the small red peaks. So we had to understand that. And, and now going back again to the insulating uh, regime, when the red, when the, uh, when the metallic band, the white one, becomes insulating, suddenly these peaks also disappear. So what we're finding, I mean, remember the black is the density of states in the narrow band. We were finding a finite density of states in gap in the narrow band while the white band is metallic, while the white band offers holes or doublons. When the white band goes mott, we do not, I mean, we, all, we only have an up, down, up, down state, there are no mobile holes or doublons, that means that, we do, that these peaks disappear. And our interpretation of these peaks are, uh, are the following. There are states like this where we have a doublon on one, on the, on one band and a hole on, in the other band, and these move coherently together by the whole, uh, by the whole system. And we looked at this by projecting now the density of states onto uh, these specific excitations. So now, instead of getting the density of states, by creating a particle, evolve, and destroying a particle wherever I destroy it, we create a quasi-particle, and we see if we have a, a high peak in that quasi-particle, we are guessing. And we did, in fact, get that. Here we have, two, we, we have two different plots, on the left and the right. On the left, we have um, 
so, so the red is the, uh, I mean, this is only the positive omega part of the spectrum. So this is the upper Hubble band. This is a metallic peak at zero. You see it's only half. And this is for a final value of de delta is uh, U minus U2. So it's the difference between the local, in, between the intra and inter orbital Coulomb interactions. When this difference is 0.3, um, we get the metallic peak here, and we get this black peak I, I showed you in the previous one for the narrow band, the black one, at a finite excitation, and this excitation is exactly U minus V, uh, U minus U2. So what we are seeing is that uh, if we have, these are the two orbitals, this is U2, the interaction between the orbitals, and this is the local U. So uh, the excitation, I mean, a, a very easy way to understand this is when you have these uh, the ground state, let's say it's, um, it's MOT, okay? So we had one in the, single, uh, in the single atom approximation. This is orbital one and orbital two. So in, in this state, we have the ground state because it's one particle per side, let's say it's a reference state. This is already pain energy U2. And if I look at an excited state, which is the Dublin, this state has energy, no, no U2, but this state has energy U. So the difference in energy of exciting a hole on Dublin with respect to a, a reference state like this is U minus U2, which we call delta. So in the local, you see what, what U2 do is, do, is doing is bringing up the reference of excitation to the Dublons. And what, it, what it's going to do, that we're going to see it now, this, the presence of, a, of an interorbital Coulomb interaction produces, brings down states from the upper Hubble band it brings, it, it brings them down in energy. So there is a weight transfer, a, a spectral transfer from the upper Hubble band towards the gap. And this is because we are including uh, the interorbital interaction U. It gives us a, a higher reference uh, to, for the excitations. Uh, so this is the peak we find. And look, the blue is the projected density of states. Uh, and it, uh, onto this state, this state means I create a particle in orbital two, which is a lower one. I create a particle in an orbital two. When there is, I create an up when there is a down and when there is a hole in particle one. So all this uh, uh, animal here is creating a hole in Dublin, okay? So when we use this for the excitations, we see the blue peaks here and one of them exactly coincides with the quasi-particle peak. And of course you see other uh, finite uh, projections inside the upper Hubble band because we have Dublons in the upper Hubble band. Now look what happens to the right. When uh, there's a special, specific point where delta is equal to zero, delta equal to zero means that the uh, U is equal to U2. So the local Hubbard is equal to the, I mean, the intra Hubbard U is equal to the inter Hubbard. So we have a special symmetry there. And in that case, uh, as the peak forms at U minus U2, a delta, delta is zero, so this peak on the narrow band forms at zero. Okay, so here we have a, a peak that looks like a metallic peak forming at zero energy because, it's, because it, costs, it doesn't cost any energy to have this configuration or this configuration. So the whole and doublons are forming at, at, at zero energy. And so then you can say, well, okay, now suddenly for this value of, of U and U2, uh, we, we get, uh, we transform the, the, mod, the narrow band into a metal because you see that uh, it, it was, it, if, it, if it weren't for U2, it would be an insulator. And the projection of the peak is exactly there. Now, what is funny, this is a, a discussion with Gavi Kotler that he, he proposed to, to calculate this. Uh, when, when you look at DMFT, this, this peak, the metallic peak, which is a coherent peak, has an antiferromagnetic correlation. If you look at the, cor the, the correlation between this effective impurity and the rest of the, or the non-interacting orbitals, you get like, it's like a condo peak. So you get an antiferromagnetic correlation. S dot S has to be uh, it's nearly minus three quarters because there is like a, like a condo singlet forming there. Okay, so in both metallic cases, well, well I mean, it's, it's a minus, uh, nearly minus three quarters, condo singlet. But if you look at the same for the other band, it's not a condo singlet. Look, the value is nearly close to zero. So this coherent peak is completely different to the coherent peak we get from the DMFT. And, uh, and so, because, so it's a different, a different peak. It's not a, it's not a metallic coherent peak. And this brings us to, a, to a, the solution of a long-standing con controversy 
whether there is or not an orbital selective mode transition when u is equal to u2, when delta is zero. What, what is this question? I mean, by, looked by several different groups. The question is, if u is equal to u2, and, uh, and I have very different bands, I, and I, uh, I, I crank up u, both bands go simultaneously uh, to, uh, um, uh, to a mod insulator, or first one band and then the other. Uh, so there were contradicting results. These groups, the Medici and Ferrer, uh, uh, Silke Biermann, they all say that, that there was, uh, there was no locking. That means that there was an orbital selective mode transition for the case delta equal to zero, but another group said that there was no uh, orbital selective mode transition. There was a locking. If one became insulating, the other would also do. We uh, found that this result is the correct result. And we can find it here. Uh, uh, here, what I'm plotting here is the quasi-particle weight that Eduardo mentioned this morning uh, as a function of, what's it, Eduardo? What? Yeah, but as a function of the interaction u. This is a quasi-particle peak for three different uh, ratios of the hopping, t1 over t2. I only want you to look at one very extreme one. Look at this, t2 is 1 50th of t1. So the hopping t1 and the hopping t2 of the lower band is 50 times smaller. So it's really a, a very, very narrow band. And in spite of this difference in, uh, in hopping, you will look at the red curve here, for small u, um, both of them are metallic. And so this is the, the, the two curves, the, this is the z, uh, in the top band and in the, in the lower band, they're always exactly the same for every value of u. So we have exactly the same quasi-particle weight in the, top, in, the, in the wide band and in the narrow band, and both of them go to zero, so the transition is simultaneous for both uh, at a certain critical value of u, and this means that the systems are locked. Why? Because the, whole, the mobile holes of the, of the wide band, they carry along doublons in the, lo in the, in the lower band, or doublons carry holes, and if we have mobile holes, these will necessarily move the carriers in the other band, uh, making it also metallic in spite of the fact that the, uh, the bandwidth is so, so narrow. So this is an interesting physical effect, and here you see really the two peaks in the narrow and the wide band, and they're exactly the same. One minute, One minute. yeah. Well, just to show you that here, I mean, with the, with slave spins, we also have some results, and these are the, 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 the these, these lines are slave spins results. Now, by looking at, by knowing these states are there, one can find them with different methods. And now using slave spins, or, or also using NRG results now for a three orbital model, um, one can find these structures. You see these peaks here. Uh, the, another paper uh, by Kotler and collaborators, they also start finding that there is some structure. And this is fun. Once you know it's there, you look for it and you find it. Well, uh, I don't have time to go into the other, into the other um, results. Just to mention that we, we did look now at the doped case already. Uh, the, the doped case also shows, for example, this is the density of states as a function of omega. Cranking up u for u2 equals zero, we have the doped lower hover band and the upper hover band. But as soon as we start cranking up u, we start finding a transfer of spectral weight from the upper hover band to the middle, and this is the holon dublon band. So there is an in-gap band here that also appears. And um, uh, this is where with different parameters, with j, we also find them. Uh, this is project projecting the density of states also um, onto different excitations, and look, and this is, this is zero, the Fermi energy, uh, the doped lower Hubbard band, and this is the, uh, the, the doped lower Hubbard band is also split, and this is what we're looking at now because we don't understand this uh, uh, reduction of the density of states, and this band is purely whole on Dublin uh, because it's projected onto the, this red is a projection onto the whole on Dublin. Um, very, uh, so the last uh, thing I want to show you is now the, the one dimensional lattice which, which is a one-dimensional with two orbitals per side. Now, this is one-dimensional with the same parameters. And what we did find is this. Uh, uh, so uh, when, when, when we have a, so the half-filled system, we have the lower Hubbard band and the upper Hubbard band. And when we dope the system with holes or with electrons, we also find it. We find that the lower Hubbard band, first of all, has a big dip, and we're studying that now again. We also see the dip in the one-dimensional version. 
And at high energies for a finite value of, of, of U2, which is B here, we find this is the upper Hubble band, this is the in gap state that is sort of, it has a lot of weight in the whole Dublin. So well, this is, so I, I'm going to finish here, so again, we see all that, we see the projections onto different states, we looked at this. So well, to conclude, uh, obviously, I mean, the systems with, uh, the, the systems are very complex, and th their complexity uh, requires that we, that we really uh, develop sophisticated and pre precise methods. We have developed this method, which is using the DMRG as an impurity solver of the DMFT, and uh, it, it, this led us to find the richer, richer structure in the local density of states that hasn't been seen before with more approximate methods. And also we find them in 2D and in one-dimensional uh, multi-orbital models. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Karen, for this very interesting talk. Questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the talk. Very nice. Uh, I have two, two questions. First, did you look at pairing correlations? Uh, this Dublin thing seems to have some, some pairing character to it. Did you look at the, at the pairing correlations of the model in, in, in that case? And second question, um, you, you had the hopping between the orbitals equal to zero. Uh, if you put it back, it's basically an Anderson model. You can explore heavy Fermion physics. Do you, do you intend to do that? Um, well, with respect to the pairing, we are looking at that now. The, remember that this whole and Dublin band for the DMFT results are excited states, okay? And, uh, and now they are appearing in many other studies. Um, Elvio D'Agoto, Adrian Feguin, other people are looking at this, and they do find excitations of, like, of the whole and Dublin type. And uh, so there is something there. I mean, even Weichselbaum, von Delft, and collaborators, they also looked at the, they also mentioned that some structure in the inner part of the Hubble bands have to do with the whole on Dublin. Now, if this might have to do something with superconductivity or with pairing, and we're looking at that because we are intrigued in, in this behavior, um, this dip. Uh, I mean, this, uh, at the Fermi energy for several uh, different parameters, it could be a charge entity uh, wave. And we're looking, we're looking at that now, so I don't have any result. And, um, and yes, of course, if you put T2 equal to zero, we get the comb, we get the Anderson lattice model. Um, what happens in there, uh, I don't know if we'll get any excited, exciting results, because I mean, if we, we, we ha you have a completely insulating uh, uh, localized states, and uh, I don't know what to expect. Maybe we, we also have a whole and double excitation for finite energies, but we haven't thought about that. But any, any suggestion is welcome, <laughs> of course. Very nice talk, Karin. Uh, I just have a technical question. I think you used the correction vector method yes. for the DMRG. Yeah. And I was looking at uh, the results by Weichsendahl et al. that you showed for the Hans method where they use NRG for a three orbital System. The energy, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's a very hard calculation. So I, I just wonder how the correction vector method in DMRG can compare in terms of numerical complexity to that. It's very tough as well. I okay. mean, uh, okay. anything you want to converge in the real axis, of course, uh, there's a lot, lot more information on the real axis because when you converge on I omega, it's like, like I usually joke, it's like a potato because they're really very... Uh, soft uh, functions and and trying to get all this structure from that once you know that there I would really like to see the CTQMC people trying to uh, get in these these results now what Gary did with collaborators is they found this this was a very you know I mean the the energy is not very precise at these energies you see but but it's quite precise here but but it, because you have the logarithmic disc discretization but they, they do get it because they hadn't seen that before, but now they know it was there because we got it, they looked for it, and they found it. But it was really very tough for them to calculate. And it's also tough for us. We had, we had days. I mean, we're using a lot of computational resources for this. It's really tough. Very nice. <laughs> More questions? Thanks, Karin. It was very nice. And I was just wondering if you 
if there is any connection between the, this quasi particle, the position of these peaks, and as a function of the Hans coupling. Have you addressed this? Yes. Um, what, what, um, with J. And, and um, the orbital locking with the Hans coupling also. Well, um, I don't know. I think we don't know that. Um, uh, what we did is, um, for example, these peaks here, this is as a function of J. Um, you see, we start for J from J equal to zero, and here we have a density of states for a certain doping and a certain uh, U2. This is a, so it's doped with holes. This is the Fermi energy. They're all shifted. Here we have a, this, uh, I mean, a, an interesting peak here. But all this is part of the, of the previous lower Hubbard band. All this, which sort of now starts to get structure with the, v, with the U2. And all this part here is the upper, it was a former upper Hubbard band. Okay, this sort of splits and, and there's a, a lot of spectral transfer. Now, for J equal to zero, we have this. And we, we start cranking up J. And uh, look at the, this is the, the Holland Dublin peak. The Holland Dublin peak here, the, uh, the, the, I mean, this is to help the eye. You see this, it sort of splits. One goes to lower energy and one goes to higher energy here. And this is due to the term that has um, perk hopping because, because this is mainly, I mean, this is also another, another verification that we have a hole in Dublin. Because the hole in Dublin is this and the pair hopping gets this and puts it here. So, and that, that uh, uh, mixing separates the, the, the peak. And then we have another effect of J, which is to separate these lower energy peaks you see, and, and this has to do with uh, with the Hund coupling that, that favors ferromagnetic states. This, uh, so this is effect. Now the locking with J, we haven't looked at it. Yeah, we only looked at the locking. No, because the lock the locking is for delta equal to zero, and delta equal to zero is U equal to U two, and there's a particular point which is a rotational invariant point in which U two is equal to U minus two J. So the really, if you want to look at the rotational invariant case, when j is equal to zero, we have the delta equal to zero locking and all that. Now, we, we were a little bit more relaxed, and we looked at different parameters. For example, we always set j equal to zero, but we varied u with respect to u2 and things like that. But if you want, the locking is for j equal to zero. Yes, I have a question which I try to explain. When one does a cluster dynamic mean field theory on the two-dimensional bulb model with one orbital only, it's not unusual to find in gap states, for example, when one dopes. And there, the thing is marked by the presence of an extra pole in the self-energy. You know, when we have a motor insulator, we have a, a divergent pole in the self-energy, and there is another one appearing. So I was wondering if, the, in the, your case, if you check if these... Uh, if there is an extra pole in the self-energy when you have these uh, in-gap states or not? Or is yeah. something different? Anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is a, an important point, uh, Marcello, because here you see it. Because, I mean, it's another indication of this gap. I mean, yeah. this extra gaps yeah. forming. But here now, with it's rotated 90 degrees, this is omega. This is the Fermi energy. And here we have one other spectra. Uh, so for the doped case, okay? So here we have... Uh, I mean, positive energies, we have the upper hover band, and here we have the in-gap state, the holon dublin band. And in between the upper and the holon dublin we have, a, 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 well, this is a pole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, this is, and this is a pole between the holon dublin and, and the... And the yeah, uh, this is the usual one, yeah. but this is another one forming in the splitting of, in, in this. So here you see something. And there's another tiny one here with this, with this negative omega excitations, too. Okay. Yeah? Is that a response to your question? Uh, yeah, so we're thinking that perhaps even cluster one should think of these uh, in cap states as all uh, uh, doubles. Uh, I mean, another one, Satoshi, for example, was uh, pushing for this interpretation, but the, we didn't have a demonstration like you. That is the case. Okay. Yeah, OK. OK. So. More questions? No? No? So let's thank Karen again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.